we are gaining 60 free alloys per month from trade deals, ladies and gentlemen. Somehow, this is perfectly acceptable. My goodness. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Stellaris, where today we're showing off the definitive most broken exploit that I believe has quite possibly ever been shown in Stellaris. We're talking about infinite resources of just about every single kind. You physically cannot lose the game if you are doing this. It's majestic, it's powerful, and most importantly, it's probably going to give speedrunners a very good and easy run at an entire galactic world conquest if they wanted to. So we're going to be showing off a relatively completely unknown exploit for Stellaris. And honestly, I'm surprised considering just how easy this exploit is to pull off. Why has no one else covered this? What are you doing other Stellaris YouTubers? This is like step one of gameplay exploiting. And of course, what is step one of game exploitation? No, not, not that. No, also not that. Yeah, none of that. Yeah, that's right. It's cheesing the AI. Now, of course, Stellaris has AI created by those fantastic boffins at Paradox Interactive. So yeah, AI is a strong word indeed, but you know, it sometimes does show intelligence. So what exploit do you think Spiff's using today? Well, it's time for you to vote and find out. Is he A, going to gain more resources than everyone else in the galaxy combined within the first 10 years of the game? Is he B, going to find a way to generate infinite research and out-tech every single person in the galaxy, becoming the most powerful space-faring civilization imaginable? Or is he C, going to absolutely cheese the trade mechanics in the game in order to become the most diplomatically influential being imaginable? Hop down into the comment section and cast your vote and you never know, you may be right. Nonetheless, we're playing Stellaris, a very well-polished Space 4X game. You get to start in your systems, you build up your systems and your planets, although in our case we're not playing on planets, we're playing via habitats. Instead of our civilization starting on lovely habitable planets, we're instead uh, having our entire population live entirely on orbiting mega space stations, and that's genuinely all they're going to do. And who are we playing today? Well, we're playing as the fantastic space empire of Dave's Dodgy Deals. Dave's Dodgy Deals is a group of about currently 30 Brit individuals who sit on space stations and scam people. At the moment, because we haven't actually encountered anyone else other than ourselves, there's not exactly many people to scam. It's mostly just been scamming ourselves, but now that we've discovered space travel, we're going to find some people out there, some AIs hopefully, to utterly destroy. Now Dave's Dodgy Deals is led of course by fantastic chairwoman Steve, who's going to be leading our glorious empire into just massive profit margins. Now, of course when you're playing as a species which is entirely in space, you're very limited on several things. Firstly, if you want to colonize new lands, you need to build more habitats. These cost a ridiculous quantity of alloys. Alloys are very expensive. You can't even particularly buy them off of the market. They're five energy each. That is an obscene amount of money to buy just one alloy. So we need to find another way to exploit it. Equally, in habitats, it's pretty difficult to grow food. Who would have guessed that? So we're going to need to find another way of growing food. But in terms of science, oh, habitats are very powerful. And in terms of trade goods, oh, habitats are even better. So immediately we're going to be sending our science ships off to explore the galaxy and just try and find some friends out there. And then we're going to ruin those friendships. Trust me, it's something I'm somewhat of a professional at doing. Why do you think no one plays multiplayer Stellaris with me? So we're going to be saving up some energy at the start of the game here. And as soon as we tick over to having 200 energy, we are going to assign a brand new leader to our fantastic shiny new science vessel, I know. Now the perks of having multiple science ships is that it means we find alien civilizations much, much faster. And that's exactly what we're doing. Ah, oh, and this is where the game's cheesing begins. It all starts with, of course, the traditions. Now, of course, when it comes to the game, traditions are a great way of increasing your empire's abilities very early on, giving you a nice boost, but they take a while to do. It currently costs us 75 unity to buy this tradition, but now it's going to cost us about 100 for the next one. Basically, for each adopted tradition, it costs 5% more to get the next one, and it just increases and increases and increases until it gets ridiculously expensive and you go from having to wait two months for every unity tradition to waiting 10 years. There is, of course, another way to get around this, and we're quite simply going to go into the policy section here, change our food policy to nutritional plentitude to increase pop growth speed, and change our trade policy to marketplace of ideas. It means we're going to basically half our energy credits production, but we're going to more than double our unity production, suddenly meaning we're going from getting the next unity tradition in six months time to one month's time. Yeah, this is fine gameplay, don't you worry. And don't worry, it's just going to get worse the more people we have in our empire, which is exactly why we're beelining our way to a new life as fast as possible for that lovely extra 10% pop speed growth. Oh, it's fantastic. And there we go, we've already picked it up and we're 
less than a year into the game. Normally at this point most empires have probably just picked up their second unity ambition, if at all. Ah, oh, this game, <laughs> what have we done to you? This isn't even an exploit, this is just actual smart gameplay mechanics and choices at this point. It's going to get a lot worse from here on out. Now of course, famously Stellaris is a very well balanced game, some would say even perfectly balanced, but actually after reality from just a brief inspection of the lovely boffins at Spivko, we've actually discovered Stellaris is in fact about as balanced as the Leaning Tower of Pisa after 17 Category 6 earthquakes. Certainly it's a bit flip floppy all over the place, which has given us fantastic windows to find creative uses of game mechanics. And thanks to the latest DLC, well, it's just added even more exploits onto the list of already very broken existing exploits. Anyway, there we go, two years into the game and we've just picked up our first ascension perk. Naturally, you either want to go for technological ascendancy for that extra plus 10% research speed, which is very nice. Now for the early on aspect of the game, don't really need to worry yourself about any form of military. At the end of the day, Dave's dodgy deals, as dodgy as they may be, are just peaceful spacefaring merchants. They don't really pose much of a threat and the only thing you should really be worried about is in case a rogue AI faction comes along and suddenly starts taking a liking to you. By the time you're actually at risk of any of that happening, you're going to be the most powerful person in the galaxy and everyone else is going to be the weakest by a very, very long margin. Now you might notice even though we're quite early into the game, we're already gaining over 135 research. This is mostly because thanks to us starting in habitats, our research districts are absolutely amazing. In comparison to normal Stellaris where you build a research lab, these research labs only give you two researcher jobs and each job outputs eight of each research. Instead in a floating habitat, each researcher outputs 12 of each research. Yes, they require slightly more to upkeep. That doesn't really make much of a difference. Oh, and also they provide their own housing and they provide one extra job. Yeah, it's, um, it's very broken. Like really, really, really broken. Especially because if you just go down the research ambition thing here, the upkeep of researchers is reduced by 20%, which is just absolutely fantastic. It makes them really cheap to maintain. You might as well just have an empire consisting of mostly researchers. Oh, and here we have it. Fantastic, ladies and gentlemen. We've just encountered three civilizations all at the same time. Oh my goodness. And they're all vaguely friendly because they're in a federation together. Okay, we've spawned next to someone in a hegemony start. What does that mean for us, ladies and gentlemen? Well, it means we have three different independent AI nations all on our doorstep who are all friendly and willing to do trade deals. This is very important as now we can start the exploitation. As you can see at the moment, we're having a fantastic start to the game, but it could be better. We're currently losing consumer goods. We don't really have as much food production as I'd like. And most importantly, we need more alloys because alloys means we can start building down habitats faster. And the faster we get more habitats down, the more we snowball completely out of control. So what are we going to do in order to get ourselves some alloys? Well, we're going to find just any of these random sieves here. In our case, the combine of Darip here who are open for trade deals. And so we're going to go up to these lovely toucan looking fellas and say, hey, I'm going to give you 10 favors. What are favors you might ask? Well, these grant the other empires a favor to be used in the future. That's right. This AI empire has favors which they can use to force us to do things. That's of course quite valuable because we could support them on something we don't actually want to assist them on. So hence, it's actually quite a valuable thing to have in a trade deal. So we're going to say, you know, what? we're generous. I will give you 10 favors to use at any time. In return, you have to give me five alloys a month and also eight minerals, please. That would be lovely. Now, what we can see by holding down the maximum monthly alloys is we can see how much this AI actually produces each month. This AI produces 17 alloys a month. We can also see that they have 209 alloys in reserve. I and mean, of course, we could try and take some of those, but the AI is just not going to have that. They wouldn't even give us one. Instead, monthly alloys, they're absolutely willingly going to hand over. I don't know why the AI values monthly alloys to be less valuable than half of that being given as actual alloys, but you know, AI moves in mysterious ways. So we can say, hello, please, can we have a portion of your monthly alloys? To be more specific, five. If we ask for more than five, the AI panics and it goes, hang on a second, we're giving over 30% of our alloys away per month. We only make 17, we're giving away five. That's too much. We can't give these people 17 alloys a month, or can we? And that's why we're going to send off that trade deal and whilst the game still paused, come up with another trade deal where we once again offer favours, ask for those five alloys a second time and you know what, we can ask for once again more minerals as well, eight minerals. So once again,
again, we ask for five monthly alloys for 10 favors, and we will repeat it yet again. Once again, we'll ask for those alloys and add on those eight minerals. And there we go. Now we are up to receiving 15 alloys per month from these lovely toucans, but that's not really where we're going to stop. We're going to send off this trade deal for one last time and ask for once again those minerals. And the reason we're doing this is not because we need this many resources. We're now asking for 20 alloys per month from this toucan, as well as 32 minerals per month. So this means the AI on paper is going to give us more resources than they produce per month for both alloys and minerals. Of course, this is if they accept the trade deal. And I mean, they wouldn't accept a trade deal because they can't give us 20 minerals per month. They don't produce 20 minerals per month. But wait, we pause the game. Oh no. The reason we pause the game, quite simply, is because until the end of the month tick, the AI's resources which are going out of the country don't change. So if you're in a multiplayer game and you're playing on a normal speed, providing you send off those trade deals quickly, you can put them in. But it's much easier if you're playing single player to just pause the game and stack up all of those trade deals. As you can see, we're not actually getting gaining any alloys from the trade deal yet. Now that's going to start next month. So we have our trade deal done with the Combine of Darab. But we're also going to move over to the Pius Husco Council over here. They're next door neighbors who are also relatively friendly and open for trading. We're going to once again offer 10 favors. And let's see how many alloys per month these guys make. They make 18 as well, very good. So we're going to once again ask for five alloys. They're going to give them over. What about food? How much food do you make? Not actually that much, but they are going to give us four food per month if we ask for it. And we will, because we like food. Food per month is very useful for an empire which can't actually produce any food. Sadly, they won't give us any consumer goods because they just don't produce enough, but it doesn't really matter because we can get the alloys we want from them as well as some bonus food along for the ride. Good stuff indeed. Now, once again, we only need to do this four times and then we are taking this empire's entire alloy production just for ourselves, which is absolutely ridiculous. But once again, perfectly fine for the AI. They don't see anything wrong with this trade deal at all. Now, one thing which is very broken with these trade deals at the moment is you can ask for, of course, infinite food. And one thing an empire is never going to do is run out of food because it needs it for its population. So I'm actually going to stack up even more trade deals where we just ask for stupid quantities of food per month. The reason why is because the AI will try to the best of their ability to keep their stockpile filled. So they're going to be spending lots of money each month to make sure there's food in the stockpile because when a month starts the trade deals come out and if there's no food left after the trade deal or not enough their population starts to starve. So when we take alloys and food and minerals away from an empire what they start doing is they start spending their energy on making sure that they can pay for all of these resources coming out. But of course it's a trade deal so it has to be balanced. The AI has to feel that it's balanced. But how is it balanced? I'm giving them 10 favors a month. 10 favors which these guys aren't ever going to be able to hand in because at any time I like, I can just invade them. How do I know I can invade them? Look, they have overwhelming fleet capabilities. I couldn't possibly defeat them. Well, they have overwhelming fleet capabilities now, but they don't have any alloys. And their economy is going to be absolutely destroyed because they're going to spend the first 20 years of this game being continuously bombarded by trade deals, which they feel are amazing, which result in them handing over almost all of their resources per month. This AI here isn't making any alloys or minerals. This empire here isn't even being given food. Its population can't grow. It will starve. It's also giving us all of its alloys so it can't expand or build up a navy. Bam, I've jumped into the midpoint of the video when you least expected me. Why am I here? Well, I'm here to remind you to go grab yourself a cup of tea because you know what? You deserve it. You're a lovely individual. You sat here watching, enjoying this video. Go grab yourself a cup of tea. Relax. Be comfortable. Hope this self-isolation is keeping you sane as well. And hey, if you need a help or just a brief chat, hop down to the comments section. I'll make sure to be there and also make sure to be there for each other. Be nice to each other and let's dive back into this lovely video. And all that's left is the Varlivi Covenant here. Lovely stuff. These friends, once again, we can give them 10 favors. They love that. How many alloys per month do you make? 22. You make more than everyone else. What does that mean? Well, it means you're going to give me seven alloys per month. That's very generous. Of course, you don't make enough consumer goods. You don't really make enough food to trade, nor do you make enough minerals. So we're only really going to be able to take food from you, which is perfectly fine. I will, however, whack on some monthly minerals for fun. So there we go. Once again, one trade deal goes off and then we'll immediately stack on more alloys to be given and four minerals for good measure. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have hit the point where all of our neighboring friends no longer have a positive 
massive alloy production each month. We have destroyed them. All we need to do is unpause. All of the positive ticks come through and that is all of our trade deals accepted by the AI. We are going to tick over into the next month and you are going to notice some strange things in my economy. We're going to go from creating the amount of alloys one empire can make at the start of the game to making 72 alloys per month. Yeah, that's um, that's not good. Oh, we are gaining 63 alloys per month from trade deals, ladies and gentlemen. Somehow, this is perfectly acceptable. My goodness. Oh, goodness, I absolutely love this game. And you know what? It also makes the AI empires love us because not only we fanatically xenophile, they have been given a bunch of positive trade deals. Look at this, all the positive reasons to become better friends with us. We're a new contact, we're a xenophile, and also they're going to start getting some upticks of happiness because we did positive trade deals with them and they love positive trade deals. But remember, over here at Dave's Dodgy Deals, we have a uptight complaints department and as soon as these guys stop being able to produce resources, that's when they're going to notice some issues. <laughs> now immediately, one of the trade deals has come to an end because the poor Velervi convent here has run out of alloys to maintain the deal. So that has absolutely collapsed through and the poor Velervi have run out of resources to give us. Don't worry, I understand that. You have an inferior economy and an inferior tech. It's perfectly understandable. Don't worry, you have just given us 72 resources. I mean, how many alloys do you even have in the bank? Only 26. Oh, you poor guys. <laughs> so we're gaining many more alloys than the game really wants us to actually collect at the start of the game. Most players do have to rush a second alloy foundry as soon as possible because it's a great way to boost up your economy. We don't actually have to do that. There's no need for us to do that. We are gaining resources at a terrifying rate. But effectively, we found ourselves in a situation where we don't need to actually develop our economy that much simply because we can steal the economy of our neighboring AI empires. And the best thing is the AI empire always feels they get the better side of the deal. So it improves relations with them, making them less likely to invade us. It also drains them of resources, meaning they're less likely to invade us. And it boosts our economy, meaning we become physically indestructible. Because even the AI empires off there, which are currently fighting amongst themselves or just developing by themselves, don't have access to the resources that are free neighboring friendly AIs all with one developed homeworld outputting copious quantities of resources. Now, of course, the AIs are going to try and get as many research agreements with us as possible. You're going to want to turn that down because being a Voidborn, your best ability is the fact that you can research faster than everyone else. Of course, all of your downsides are negated by using this exploit because not only do you research faster than everyone else, you gain resources faster than everyone else. And well, generally, you can just do everything better and faster, which is an issue. But wait, you can't settle on planets. Well, actually, once again, that's wrong because you can just get a migration treaty from a friendly AI and suddenly you can settle on planets or you can just send robots to do it for you. Oh, goodness, this game. Oh, no, no, no. So yes, we're going to get a migration treaty with an AI empire, which is very great because it means population on our planets are going to grow even faster. It also means if we encounter a planet which we can settle on, we just do, which is great. Oh my goodness, this is incredible. The Combine of Derep have actually run out of alloys, but they're still giving us alloys per month <laughs> for the sole reason that they are buying them off of the local marketplace. Admittedly, it is driving up the cost of alloys for everyone else, but I don't need to buy alloys off of the marketplace. It's a terrible idea. It costs so much money. Oh, and there we have it. We're only 11 years into the game and we're about to build ourselves our first habitat. We've hit 3,000 alloys, meaning, well, bam, he can be built. Our precious, lovely, super awesome habitat of money making. Now, of course, this is a very difficult decision. Do we want to get ourselves more minerals or do we want to get more energy or more research? At the moment, minerals are going to be a fantastic source of money making. So we're going to destroy a mining station and build ourselves a lovely mining habitat around Mondax Retreat. Lovely stuff. So there we go. We have our first habitat underway. Oh, and of course, we have the resources to back it up as well. Now, of course, the biggest drawback of being on massive floating habitats is that you can't produce food. So you, the lovely player, have two ways to get around this. Way number one, find a way to produce food. Way number two, find a way to no longer need food by becoming a glorious, over-the-top, synthetic creature of pure perfection. But of course, you can do both. I'm not saying that you have to go down the line of robotics, even though it is the better thing to do, you can of course
course, try and find a way of growing food. And sure, you might want to build a bunch of stations with hydroponics bays which can produce free food per month or manually trade to gain food every month. That's something you can do. Alternatively, you can just get a single migration treaty with the AI and then settle a planet and just build some farms there like a normal person does. It's stupid, but it does work. After all, you get to play the faction which gets ridiculous bonuses for being sat in habitats whilst also negating all of the negatives of being the very over the top and powerful dude who gets to sit in habitats. It is perfectly balanced, of course, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and of course, with our thousand energy, which we've now stored up, we're going to establish a branch office on one of the enemy planets because we can. Now, there's a couple of bonuses of branch offices. I strongly recommend building a commercial forum in all of your branch offices to start off with and then follow it up with a corporate embassy. Corporate embassies increase your diplomatic weight from economy. Basically, you become a diplomatic powerhouse if you are an economic faction and you can build as many of these as you like, provided you've built a branch office. This means you can destroy the diplomatic weight mechanic in this game by simply building a hundred of those buildings. Suddenly your diplomatic weight from the economy can go from 1,000 to 2,000. Then you start whacking on other modifiers and you've gone from 2,000 to 4,000 and 4,000 to 8,000, 8,000 to 16,000 and 16,000 to I am the bloody galactic senate. Ah, this game, it's got some unintended gameplay features. <laughs> Especially because also these AI factions are never going to get rid of a branch office because it gives me money and it gives them money as well. They love branch offices. That just makes them all the more powerful. Even though we actually haven't finished the construction of our first glorious habitat, we already almost have the materials to build a second glorious habitat, uh, which is downright stupid. Um, there have been times when I've played multiplayer games and if I had this, late game you would be unstoppable because having more planets and more resources and the ability to make more resources early on means you can make more resources in the later game. I'm actually going to have to build a second construction ship because we're about to hit the stage where we can build our second absolutely over the top floating complex, which is stupid, absolutely stupid. But hey, this is Stellaris. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. If you've enjoyed this very unique way of playing Stellaris, uh, you can support it by, of course, giving it a like and uh, the developers will notice that you've enjoyed this and go, oh no, we've done it. He's, uh, he's found exploits. So we should probably patch those out. And you know what? They will try and patch them out, but it's okay because we'll just find more. And there we have it. Only four years after the first habitat has begun construction, we're going to immediately build the next one on the list. Oh, done it. The game's broken. It's really broken. This is absolutely stupid. You should not have access to 3,000 alloys at the start of the game. If we wanted with those 3,000 alloys, we could have built the largest fleet imaginable and invaded all three of these civilizations. But we don't want to do that. These are farms for resources. They will always have ha positive and happy relations with us, and we will always be able to siphon off lots and lots of goods from them. And of course, we can build our branch offices on them. I mean, just look at that. 20 energy credits a month thanks to that branch office, and 18 from this one. I love a good branch office. Oh, and there we go. Our first habitat is complete and we can send over the colonization party. Of course, it's going to be us lovely Brits going over to colonize it first. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? I think we're going to keep it nice and short. I think that's absolutely perfect for showing off today's glorious exploit. You can take it from this point to ridiculous levels. You know, Dave's dodgy deals overtake every single AI faction in the galaxy, although we probably already have. We are only 17 years into the game. We are producing 300 science, which is downright stupid. We are gaining more resources than any other AI faction in the game currently. We have completed one over the top absolutely bonkersly overpowered habitat which allows us to mine at a terrifying speeds and we've got a second one going and we're also heading at full speed to building another habitat before our fifth habitat's actually finished even construction. So from this point on we snowball into glory, success and profit. We're making more energy credits, unity, alloys, influence, consumer goods and food than everyone else in the game as well as research. These are all of the important resources resources that you need in order to control the galaxy and influence the game. And we have the most of everything and we've broken it. And what did it cost us? 10 favors each time. And what do favors do? Absolutely nothing. The AI doesn't use them. It doesn't know how to use them because it's an AI. If it was a player, it would be using it to force me into wars, things I didn't want to do. An AI can't do that. An AI can't tell when a trade deal is actually scamming it. And that is why the AI in Stellaris is absolutely broken and why you can gain infinite resources and become the most powerful, dodgy dealing, wheeler dealing Dave ever imaginable. Now go grab yourself a cup of tea, not a coffee Dave, I know you want to, you shouldn't. A nice refreshing cup of tea, that's what you need. If you've enjoyed the video, you can give it a like, you can go down to the comment section and tell me about your lovely cup of tea you're drinking today, and you can also 
tell me about how you plan to load up a brand new game of Stellaris and play it with your friends this weekend. A very good choice indeed. I'm sure they'll enjoy this new discovery. Just don't blame me when they don't ever want to play video games again with you. Trust me, it's worth it. As always though, a massive thank you to each and every one of our majestic patrons who make these fantastic videos all the more possible. You lovely chappies, thank you very much. And hey, if you want to see more of the lovely Spiffing Brit, you can subscribe to the channel and you'll be continuously bombarded with lovely notifications every other two days when we upload a video. So hey, do yourself a favour and join the community. We'd absolutely love to have you on board. Anyway, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have an absolutely lovely day and goodbye for now, my friends.